thanks to everyone who's joined. I hope you find this useful. I am going to share my screen, so I hope everything comes across clearly. Um, can you just give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Okay, thank you, I see. Um, okay, so um, today I'm talking about seed saving and living seed banks. But before I can get into that, I have to actually pay homage to the place where I learned about seed saving and seed banks. Um, and that's at an organization called Navdanya. So, um, Navdanya is the name of an organization um, where I worked for about two years. Um, it is founded by Dr. Vandana Shiva. Uh, she is an activist, an author, an all-round trailblazer and powerhouse. If you have not watched any of her videos, or her talks or a podcast, I would highly recommend it. Um, she's very passionate. She uh, started an organization called Navdanya, which is the one I worked at about uh, in 1991, I think. Um, I worked there from 2012 to about 2014. So um, Navdanya works to preserve um, India's biodiversity and food heritage um, by focusing on seed, on water, on soil, um, and then uh, knowledge and food, sovereignty. So sovereignty essentially just means freedom or independence. So not being dependent on any other structures or larger corporations, um, but very democratized and local. So that's what um, Navdanya does. And so we, there's many verticals within Navdanya and I was um, living and working on the farm. Um, so this is called Navdanya's Biodiversity and Conservation Farm. It's located in the north of India. Um, um, on the foothills of the Himalayas. So if you actually look at the photo on the right, um, towards the back left, you can actually see the, the Himalayas um, vaguely. So uh, the farm is actually a demonstration farm as well as a conservation farm. So all the principles and practices that Dr. Uh, Shiva as well as the organization promotes um, are actually shown here as uh, in the demonstration fields and it's called the conservation fields as well because Navdanya saves many many seed varieties and I'll get into this later um, and so if you can see this photo on the left the, the fields are actually divided into these subplots and those are different varieties of rice that are actually growing um, so that's the conservation field because there's many different varieties of rice and then on the right these are this is a demonstration of um, 12 varieties of crops being planted in one plot. So it's trying to show the symbiosis and how different prop, um, crops can actually support each other. So it's um, demonstration because Navdanya also trains farmers in these practices and in seed saving and in organic farming. So um, that's what the fields are often used for. But we also have something called the Earth University, which is where um, Navdanya organizes uh, workshops and conferences so and courses, anything from two days to 30 days long on either agroecology or um, farming philosophy or um, we have, actually there's a lot of workshops and courses on Gandhiji's philosophies and teachings. So on um, that, but we also have coupled with our seed bank, which you can see on the right, which is where all the different varieties are saved and stored. And then this is also, again, a demonstration seed bank. So when farmers come from all over India, they can see an example of a, a seed bank that is functioning. And I'll get into that more later in my talk. Um, before we can actually get into seed saving, we have to understand um, plant breeding and so uh, or plant reproduction. For I'm guessing most of us are familiar with sexual reproduction but you're all lucky, I'm gonna go through it a little bit today. Um, so um, as most of you would know, you require male and female organs, right? For um, fertilization to take place. This would be, if you can see, this is an example of a flower, right? Cause that's where the sexual organs are on a plant. There are the anther where the pollen re resides. And then there's the stigma in which the pollen has to be deposited into, which will then travel down and fertilize the ovule, which is the egg. Actually in plants, um, most plants, again, generalization, most plants, there's two fertilizations that take place. Um, if you can see, there's two nuclei here. So one actually becomes the zygote and the other will actually become the starchy portion, which ends up being the food um, it, for the zygote. So if anyone has seen like a black eye bean, 
the black spot is actually the zygote, whereas the brown portion ends up being the starch or the, the food for the zygote. Um, so that's how fertilization takes place, right? But like, un, well, in the animal kingdom, right? So with us mammals, male and female are on two separate individuals, right? Now in plants, it gets a little more complicated because there's a little more diversity in plants. What happens is that you can have some plants that actually have male and female, a male and female on separate individuals, right? So an example for anyone who is a gardener or a farmer would know like a papaya, a papaya plant, right? You can have a papaya plant with just female flowers or a papaya plant with, and with just male flowers. So if you have just planted one single papaya plant and it is female flowers, and if there's no male papayas nearby, that plant is not gonna give you any fruit because there's no way for it to be fertilized. So um, that's just one example. So that's on separate individuals. But it is also possible in the plant kingdom for flowers or one single individual plant to have both. And within this, there's even more diversity. <laughs> so what can happen is, is there's a complete flower, which I just showed you in the second slide. This is known as a complete flower because the male and the female organs are on the same physical flower, correct? But in an incomplete flower, you can have just a male or a fem or just female within the same plant. So a good example of this and a very um, easy one is corn, right? So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit for a photo of corn, if you can see. So on the left, the top of this plant, that's actually the pollen. And on the right, what we know as the cob with that hair sticking out, that is actually the female. So each hair is actually going to get pollinated, right? So the pollen will fall on a hair and travel down. And each of those corns is a single seed, right? So one hair attaches and becomes one corn seed. So that's actually how is a good example of where the male and female are in one single plant. So what happens then is if you have a complete flower, then it's usually self-pollinated, which means that, you know, the same pollen from the same flower is pollinating its own flower with the female part. Now, this is obviously not a hundred percent exact science. Um, but it's usually accurate 95% of the time. So you can guess that it's the same, it's coming from the same, the pollen is coming from the same plant. Now, again, it gets trickier with a corn plant, right? Because the pollen is at the top of the plant, wind blows, insects fly by, a bird might fly by and brush against the pollen and take it to another plant. So this is called cross-pollination because the pollen can travel much further um, uh, by wind, insects, birds, animals, you know, other vectors, right? So this is called cross-pollination. Now, if any one of you have bought seeds, and I'm just trying to go through the jargon here, but if anyone has bought seeds and, you've, and it says open, like OP seeds, which means open pollinated seeds, it could be either of these. It could either be self-pollinated or cross-pollinated. It just means that it has been pollinated naturally. So it hasn't been created in a lab or it hasn't been made by researchers or by a seed company. Or it could be a seed company, but then the seed company has let the pollination happen in a natural process. Um, to these types of pollination, there are always exceptions. So I want to acknowledge there's no hard and fast rule in nature, right? Um, so here I'm giving you an example, uh, avocado. Um, a certain variety of avocado, the flowers will be female in the morning, but they'll be male in the afternoon. So if you just have one avocado tree, you're never going to have any fruit. So you need to have a separate variety whose flowers are male in the morning and female in the afternoon. Magical, right? Because Other, otherwise there will be no pollination or fertilization taking place. So my first recommendation, tip one, always look up your plant, right? Try to understand what its requirements are, how it functions, what its needs are. Um, next slide, I'm gonna go into some definitions and terminology so it doesn't get confusing. Um, I just used one and I said variety. You need varieties of avocados, right? Is what I just said. So a variety is basically within a species, um, there's sub, subgroups, right? So we've all had different types of apples. Right? So it's different varieties of apples or we've eaten different types of grapes, right? So those are all different varieties. Varieties can be based on flavor. It can be based on color. It can be based on texture. Any kind of uh, physical characteristics will display the variety, 
right? Um, when someone says modern varieties, that usually means that it's been a variety that has been bred through modern methods of breeding, right? So by researchers or by scientists or by seed companies. If someone says, hey, this is an indigenous variety or an heirloom variety, that usually means it's been passed down from generations in an informal way, either through farmers or gardeners or people like you and I who, you know, do it as either as like a job or even do it as like a hobby or a thing on the side. But it's something that's happened a little more informally between people and been passed down from generation to generation. So usually these varieties are much older. Um, now, when the next definition I have to go through, sorry if I'm going through a lot of information, but I'm trying to have everyone understand, um, is a pure line. So pure line is a variety, is if you save its seed and you plant it, that generation is gonna look like its parents. So that means that the genetics are essentially identical. So the successive generations are not going to, I mean, they might have a few variations, but generally most of the traits that it displays will mimic, mimic the parent um, generation, right? Now there's something called a clone, which most of us are actually familiar with. A clone again has the same genetics, but that's not, it's not been produced through fertilization. When we use stem cuttings or we use a tuber and plant, that we've used vegetative propagation, right? So there hasn't been any pollination or fertilization that has taken place. So th there's the distinction. So essentially it's actually just a clone. Like, so if you cut a spring onion and you have the roots left over and you plant it, that is vegetative pollination and it, there's been no fertilization. So that's the distinction, but the genetics are the same, right? Because the same kind of spring onion will grow again. You will not miraculously have a different variety of spring onion. So now this is where it gets a little more complicated. When you and I have gone to the market and we've bought a hybrid seed on the packet, it says hybrid seed. And if you open the packet, sometimes it's like an insane purple color or it's an insane pink color on the seed. Um, that is because it's actually coated in a pesticide because they want to make sure that it's not consumed by humans or animals, but it's used for planting. Um, so that's one way to know you. If someone passes you a seed, and it's like, hey, these are seeds that I'm sharing with you. You can know it's a hybrid if it's got that wild coloring on it, like a powdery coloring, is you know that it has not been saved um, by the person themselves. It's definitely been um, bought and in the market, uh, so created by a seed company. So hybrid is when you take two pure lines, which I explained to you, and you have them pollinate, fertilize. So you can choose what are the variants you like. So suppose, I have a tomato plant and I really like the red color and the, the size and shape, but I, haven't, but I don't love the flavor. So I have another tomato variety whose flavor I love. So I want to combine the two hypothetically. So what I would do is I would probably use hand pollination and try to pollinate it. So this is where it gets tedious and uh, very laborious. But what happens is the seeds, so if I hand pollinate it and it develops a tomato, I would save the seeds from that. And what I plant would be called the F1 generation of the hybrid. Um, F1 gener mean, denotes the first generation. So F is generation and one is the, um, the number of the generation. Now, when you cross and you plant an F1, the traits are all the same. All the tomato plants will show similar traits. There will not be any wild differences between the plants, the way they look, or even the flavor usually. As soon as you save seeds from an F1 and plant that again, that is an F2. And that is where it goes crazy because now it's been two sets of genes have now mixed together and the following generation starts showing an insane mix of all those um, insane combinations of those traits, if you understand what I mean. So F2 ends up being wildly different in what it shows up in the field. So what happens is breeders have to usually save seeds for seven to nine generations before it stabilizes into those particular traits because every generation you're selecting what you liked. So I la okay, so suppose in F2, I try to search for all the ones that had the right shape with the right flavor and I will save that seed and plant it again. In then F3, I will look for those same traits again and I will save seeds from that and plant it again. So there's a huge intention and objective 
in a way that is going into selecting the trait 